thank everyone for um, coming here, and uh, I would like to thank organizers for um, inviting me. I, I heard about the um, the conference of Uyghur Academy last year, and so I'm really pleased that I was able to come. Um, so, um, unfortunately, I I can only give a presentation in 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 uh, English, uh, specifically when it comes to science. You know, I I, I don't know how to. Uh, say many terms in Uyghur. So, but I'll, I'll try to uh, kind of be very slow. And, and I know most of you uh, speak uh, English, so should be should be understandable. Um, so, some of my slides are maybe a little bit technical because they, I just came from a conference where I presented some of these data. But I'll, I'll try to to explain in more simple terms. Um, so, uh, I I have. Been working in kind of two major areas of research. One is um, in stem cells, and particularly, uh, we try to make new stem cells that usually our body doesn't have. Um, and uh, the other, uh, my research area is to to study the gene defects um, that that cause sometimes aging, and that specifically um, concerns to mitochondrial genes. Um, so the, the mitochondria are organelles in each cell, cell and, uh, and they have actually their own um, genome that's usually inside of this mitochondria. It's called mitochondrial DNA. And so we as a humans, and actually most of the animals, will have two different genomes. One is nuclear gene genome, which is, contains most of the genes that you know, we know about. But the mitochondrial genes are very separate because they reside in cell cytoplasm and it's a very small and circular DNA. But their function is very important because they provide energy for everything we do. So basically, while I'll be speaking to you, I'll be breathing the air and I have to do it like very often because the, my mitochondria need this oxygen. So what mitochondria does, it takes this oxygen, and of course the food that we eat in form of, um, for example, glucose, and it converts into the, the molecule, uh, it's called ATP, which uh, uh, it's kind of universal molecule that now our body and cells can use um, to basically to every function. So the mitochondria uh, provide very basic uh, um, you know, function that basically support the life. Um, so uh, mitochondria, um, mitochondrial DNA is, is, as I said, very different, uh, and, and uh, we actually just learning, you know, how this mitochondrial DNA functions. Uh, well, you know, actually, it's been discovered pretty, uh, you know, late compared to nuclear genome. Um, so the only we inherit our mother's mitochondrial genome because it's only oocyte or egg uh, provides the uh, mitochondrial genome whether for some reason sperm doesn't, doesn't contribute any. Um, so the, another interesting thing is that the mitochondrial genome, since you know, we don't have um, paternal genes, so there is no recombination, there is no heterozygosity, and it's considered that mitochondrial genome is passed from one generation to another without any change, even though it's not exactly true, and at least in my lab, we study the, the changes that occur in mitochondrial genome in eggs and how this mitochondrial genome evolves um, with evolution in you know, species. Um, interesting thing is the mitochondrial, each, each cell has a thousand mitochondria and uh, that, that's uh, how we could have up to uh, 10,000 copies of mitochondrial genome in each cell. So the um, mitochondrial DNA has been known to, to prone to mutations, so they mutate uh, much more often than the nuclear genes, and that's why the, there are a variety of changes uh, will accumulate mutations in mitochondrial DNA, and it's considered that it's actually it's um, um, processes um, depends on, on the level of energy use. So many tissues that use lots of energy, for example, it could be heart and brain, they actually get more damage to the mitochondria, and they age faster. And that's how the, the primary causes of the aging or age-related disease are in those tissues. Could be heart, heart attack or, or stroke. And it's considered that um, the mitochondria are in, in, in the basically, um, that's what's causing these uh, conditions. Um, we also study some of the genes, mitochondrial genes, that, um, mutate in eggs, and, and that's how they pass from mother to, to children. 
Um, so the mitochondrial gene mutations actually affect every part of the body just because you know they, they constituently expressed everywhere because every cell needs energy. Uh, but they primarily uh, strike um, the, the tissues that use most of the energy, and it happens to be brain, and the heart, and the other, other vital tissues and organs. Um, so the, when mutations occur in, in, in eggs, basically, it's uh, inherited um, gene mutations. Uh, it's really difficult to predict, you know, um, how they will be passed, just because um, mutations occur not like in every copy of mitochondria DNA, usually in the part, and it's called the uh, heteroplasm. It's basically a mixture of two different um, uh, mitochondrial types, mutated and healthy. And that ratio always changes, and that's how, for example, this mother, she, she was affected, you know, in red. But she, could, she passed it to her two daughters that um, had very low mutation load. Well, basically, just 20%, 25% mutation of 44. And these um, daughters were uh, phenotypically healthy, uh, but they passed to next generation more mutated uh, copies. And for example, this son had 85%. And most of the time, when um, the threshold reaches more than 50%, sometimes more than 60%, that's where the disease uh, usually uh, appears. So the um, inheritance is very complex, and it's impossible to predict whether the, the next child will be um, healthy or not. So we've been um, trying to, to come up with a solution. For example, if a family has uh, this gene mutation, and for example, they already had a, one child uh, that's been affected, um, can they have another child healthy and and uh, the way we, we we thought is you know we we don't have to kind of basically try to predict uh, but we have to go and and treat these mutations before actually it's passed to the embryo and the way we did it is that um, since this mitochondrial genome is passed from the egg so basically um, a female will provide the egg and sperm as, as I said does not contribute any Mitochondria, all this mitochondria will be contributed to the offspring. So we, we come up with the idea that we could replace uh, the mitochondrial genome from one egg. Uh, for example, this is mutated egg, then it has all this you know, mitochondria mutated. Uh, but we could remove the nucleus and, and throw away the cytoplasm, that's where the mutated genes are. But the donor mitochondria would have to come from another egg. So that was the whole idea that we don't have to make these artificial genes, but we could just um, take it from uh, from another egg donor, just like a tissue donation or organ donation. So it's very similar, but in this case, it's gene donation. Uh, so this was uh, the concept we've been working for many years, actually. And of course, initially we tested in animals, and so we showed that this procedure can be done. And uh, so now you can fertilize this this um, egg with sperm um, and uh, then transplant this embryo into a um, monkey. And these are our first monkeys that were bo born in 2009, uh, Mito and Tracker. So they've been both um, born um, after basically completely replacing the mutated DNA. Um, so you know, since then, we produced several more. And this is when they were born. and it's. Uh, this is when they're three years old, um, and we showed that they, now they don't have any disease. Uh, they're healthy, and of course, the they, 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 they mitochondria genome is completely replaced. It's healthy, uh, and there is no um, recurrence of these mutations. So this was kind of um, uh, work uh, that we've done in rhesus macaque, and we published it in 2009. And, uh, and of course, we proposed it now. This treatment probably will work for human. Uh, because of, you know, we work with, with monkeys, and monkeys are considered non-human primates, and very close species to us, and usually whatever works in monkeys, you can easily translate to, to humans. Um, even though the, it's a very expensive model to work. But um, I've, I've been blessed to work at the, one of the largest uh, non-human primate research centers in Oregon, uh, where we have, of course, access to so thousands and thousands of uh, monkeys. So once we did this, uh, we, um, we decided that we need to replicate at least a portion of this work in with human eggs. In this case, uh, we didn't have completely approval to transplant this embryo in, into, um, into patient, 
uh, but we could create this embryos um, in vitro and basically it was the same. We would take it from patient carrying mutations and then healthy egg donor would provide the cytoplasm or my healthy mitochondria. And we did this replacement and also showed that now this embryo is, looks healthy with completely new mitochondria genome and we, we made actually stem cells instead of babies. And we did all these uh, tests on, uh, on, on stem cells. So we, um, the title of this paper that we published uh, this year in Nature was toward germline gene therapy. So it's a uh, gene therapy of inherited diseases and it's uh, because we're dealing with germ cells, the cells that actually are passed to the next generation. Um, uh, it has uh, some, you know, uh, the ethical concerns because um, um, procedures like that are actually banned in many countries just because um, I think the early when, when scientists actually developed this recombinant DNA, transgenic animals, um, so they, you know, the society and, and people started worrying that, you know, some days it will come to humans and we will be genetically engineering humans, you know, enhancing. Uh, even though this procedure is developed for basically treating mutations that cause terrible diseases, but there are still uh, rules uh, that we have to go through. For example, and as I said, in many countries, the law prohibits um, any genetic manipulation of the germline. Uh, that, for example, uh, um, in UK. But since the procedure has been developed and we show the efficacy, so now governments are looking into changing the law. So the, in the United Kingdom, they've been looking for second year now to change the law just because we have a procedure. And they're changing specifically to this mitochondrial gene mutations just because um, this seems like it's gonna work. And uh, it's considered that probably sometimes next year the UK will, will be first country approving uh, this kind of procedure. So I'm very proud that we, we took it from um, basically from the um, concept and we did it in animal model and then we moved to, to human. Um, basically it's, we consider this is phase one study on safety and efficacy. Uh, so uh, in the United States, uh, we, I also approached the FDA and uh, we, we proposed that we start clinical trials as well. And at the end of this month, we're going to have a um, committee hearing uh, where they're going to basically uh, you know, I'll, you know, decide how they're going to regulate these clinical trials and what the condition is going to be. But I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will start the clinical trials sometimes next year. And uh, so the idea is that you know, now these embryos will be transplanted into, into patients and we will uh, um, monitor healthy uh, health of the children and up to maybe three to five years after birth. So this would be a first in history um, when we basically cure genetic diseases um, and basically before they happen. So um, my other part of the lab actually working with, with stem cells, is, um, particularly we work with kind of early embryonic cells. It's one of the uh, early stem cells that can make every other you know, uh, cell type. Uh, initially, um, these cells were established as a cell line from early embryo. And uh, it was done in 98 by my colleague, also primatologist, who used to work at the same primate center where I am now. So he's done it first in, in rhesus macaque, of course, as a model, and then he did it in, in humans. Um, so the, these cells can be cultured to like early stem cells, and they don't differentiate unless you allow them. But you could multiply them to many, many uh, passages and make lots of cells. But then you could induce them to differentiate into uh, all these cell types. And, you know, and, and of course, many of these cells are needed for these patients, for example, you know, especially if it's age-related disease um, and if it's a Parkinson or, or diabetes, now we have a cells um, that you know, we could transplant the patient. But the, the problem was that the immune compatibility, as you know, the, this is, came from unrelated embryo um, and it wouldn't you know, match to, to the patient that needs uh, these cells. Um, of course, we don't have these stem cells in our body. We wear these stem cells, you know, right after fertilization, but these stem cells during normal development, they differentiate into our body parts. So uh, that was kind of one of the main um, obstacles, how to use these cells for, for treating patients. Uh, there was actually uh, in 2006 when um, Japanese scientist Shinya Yamanaka 
uh, from Kyoto University, he actually found a way uh, to make artificial stem cells. In this case, he would just take uh, any cell type from the body, usually sometimes it's skin cells, and then by transducing them with uh, several genes, and these are kind of set of genes that he used, he can actually turn them into cells that just look like embryo-like stem cells. So he, he called them uh, pluripotent cells, induced pluripotent cells, or IPS. So it's a um, very promising um, field, and, and it's been you know, basically um, used since then in, in thousands and thousands of labs. And uh, he was awarded um, um, Nobel Prize for that last year. So he's, he's a prominent uh, Japanese scientist. So now it seems like we have a stem cells that will match to this patient. Uh, but unfortunately, for the last few years, when we study these cells, they, it seems like they have lots of genetic abnormalities compared to normal embryonic stem cells. So they, you know, they have uh, mutations that presumably cause during this kind of conversion. Uh, and also, there are some, you know, the epigenetic profiles. They basically, they have a memory that they came from these skin cells that not, don't exactly match to embryo-derived stem cells. So those issues actually now are kind of um, not allowing to move these cells or propose these cells to, for treatment of patients. So the IPS cells have been mainly used just uh, on the petri dish kind of disease model. So it seems like uh, we still need uh, clinical grade uh, histocompatible stem cells. And um, so in my lab, we've actually been trying to derive a new class of stem cells. Uh, this time we, we use kind of different approach. It's, it's a called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And the way we do it, uh, we will take, for example, any somatic cell from a patient, just like Yamanaka did, and this could be a skin cell. But we don't do this kind of genetic uh, uh, induction of pluripotency, but what we do is we take a nucleus, but we put it into, uh, into egg cytoplasm, so they, it's unfertilized egg. And for some reason, the, um, the human egg uh, cytoplasm has um, factors that we still don't know which one are they. They can induce change um, in, in this skin cell and make it like an early embryo, and then you could make embryonic stem cells. So these factors seems like uh, universal in every species. That's how the cloning of Dolly has been done. But of course, in this case, we were not intending to clone humans, but to make stem cells, and even though the people still call them cloned stem cells. So um, this type of uh, work has been envisioned almost 15 years ago when, when um, Jimmy Thompson first developed human stem cells. That's when everybody thought this is a way you could make stem cells, but uh, it didn't work for, uh, for so many years. But in my lab, we've been working on this for the last 10, 15 years. So this is kind of my expertise area to understand what's in cytoplasm, that induces reprogramming, how support is reprogramming. And of course, we also used initially um, monkeys. We, we made similar stem cells in monkeys in 2007, the same year when Yamanaka made his induced pluripotent cells. But that time I was in, in, a, in a monkey, and it took us uh, like five years to translate it to human, um, so we had to adapt. And um, several months ago, we published in Cell the you know, first kind of uh, um, proof of concept, now you can make these stem cells. Uh, so, um, of course, you need all the eggs to make these um, cells, so that's kind of um, uh, negative, so we always need eggs, but we made it so efficiently that, you know, basically, you only need like two eggs to make one cell line, which is um, incredibly high efficiency. Um, and it doesn't seem like it matters. We could make it from very young uh, patient, or we could make it from a patient that, you know, like 72 years old and has a, uh, a disease, a neurological disease. But most importantly, of course, now we made these stem cells, everybody was asking, are these cells the ones where we, everybody was looking? Are these clinical grade? And so the last few months, we've been comparing them to these Yamanaka cells, our cells. So it basically, they came from the same source, from the same skin, from the same patient. But uh, we would make it using Yamanaka technique, or we would make it our own. And we've been comparing, especially those genetic mutations that uh, we know the IPS cells have. Uh, so we use um, the platform, it's called SNP genotyping that actually looks for almost five million different you know, loci in, in human genome and compares them. And basically what it 
shows is actually we, sh we see that those Yamanaka cells have a very high number of these uh, abnormalities. So basically it's uh, more than two per each cell line, um, all kind of abnormalities. So the, our clone stem cells have much less, so basically three-fold less. Uh, and that it shows that these cells, uh, at least, you know, we, we made four cell lines, only two of them had kind of minor abnormalities, but two were very clean. And this is the first time we could, we could you know, derive that such a clean genetically cells that have no uh, kind of mutations or arrangements. Uh, another thing is, as I said, the, the epigenetically, the, the level of reprogramming. So the induced pluripotent cells, they always have a memory that, for example, if they came from skin cell, they kind of resemble skin cell, and these are kind of, uh, you know, the way we do it, we do uh, global methylation profiling, that's one of the ways to look at the epigenetics. And of course, we've been comparing our clone cells uh, to iPS cells, and you could see uh, in, in various regions of the chromosomes, this one is on X chromosomes, so the level of reprogramming, very complete. So the, our cells look like real embryo-derived stem cells. Uh, we, we've looked at a variety of different regions where you could always see that nuclear transfer cells stay very close to embryo derived, uh, where the IPS always have a, um, the kind of abnormally reprogrammed regions. Uh, we also looked at the um, gene expression using this kind of new way of what's called RNA seq, and we also showed that the, these clone cells are very similar to. Uh, uh, to basically to embryo derived. So this is kind of, I think, four cell lines, and this is two controls. And these are IPS cells, this is Yamanaka cells, and they're quite different in variety of regions. Uh, so basically, um, we haven't still published this paper, but everybody is expect to show um, these cells. Are they really clinical grade? Can they be now used for transplantation? And so far, they, they looks like, yes, it's, it's a real cells. They, they just like embryo derived, even though the they nucleus came from patient, and that means they're histocompatible. So we kind of, we've been able to take best from two different cell types that existed before. We had real embryonic cells, but with, uh, with patient's uh, own nucleus. Um, and it looks like, you know, we, we got these cells now, and hopefully this kind of now move to clinics faster. So the, uh, basically, we, we're preparing now this pa paper and we're showing you know, all these differences between these two, two different cell types. Um, so the conclusions are, you know, basically, epigenetically and transcriptionally, our clone cells are very close to genuine you know, uh, embryo-derived stem cells from in, in vitro fertilization. And we also see that iPS cells uh, have very uh, high uh, genomic abnormalities and the, our clone stem cells have very little and so they, we hope that these cells will be um, much easier now, for example, to, to approve through FDA as a, as a therapeutic agent. So that's kind of uh, the second part of my lab and uh, we've been working, as I said, in uh, these cloning techniques for years and the main idea was, of course, now we could produce high quality stem cells that now probably we could use it for, uh, for therapeutic purposes. So this is basically, we use eggs, unfortunately, but we get high quality cell, which is a clinical grade. Um, so I, I have a, a bunch of people that work in my lab. This is a member of my, members of my lab. Uh, but I also collaborate with uh, lots of clinical departments. So for example, when we need eggs, um, so we have a, Department of OBGYN, um, you know, that's where they, they, they enroll patients and they retrieve eggs. Um, and uh, so I enjoy uh, funding from uh, uh, NIH, that, but unfortunately NIH only funds uh, animal studies. Uh, but unfortunately um, NIH does not fund human uh, uh, studies and so we have several um, non-federal funding, some of them are private funding that support my lab. Um, so that's basically all um, in, in short. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too, too technical, but uh, you know, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to entertain. Yes, please. Uh, 